Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Brittany Wilson, Associate Professor of Law and Director of the Civil Rights and Disability Justice Clinic at New York Law School. Prior to her current position, Professor Wilson was a staff attorney at the National Center for Law and Economic Justice, a Bertha Justice Fellow at the Center for Constitutional Rights, and a Marvin M. Karpatkin Fellow in the Racial Justice Program at the American Civil Liberties Union. Born with cerebral palsy, Wilson has written and spoken extensively about disability and the intersection of race and disability for various media outlets, including The Nation, Long Reads, This American Life, NPR, PBS NewsHour, Color Lines, and The Huffington Post. Professor Wilson has also testified about issues facing people with disabilities both before local and international governing bodies, including the New York City Council and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. An accomplished creative writer and artist, Wilson has also published and performed short stories, creative nonfiction essays, and poetry, including on the HBO series Brave New Voices. On May 16th, 2023, Brittany Wilson will give a talk, Down for the Cause, Grace, Space, and Belonging in Social Movements, as a guest of the Oregon Humanities Center and part of the 2022-23 Belonging series. Thanks, Brittany, for coming on the show. It's great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about your background and what sparked your interest in the law. Sure. Um, I always say that the law wasn't a career choice for me, um, that if I had my real choice, um, I'm a writer. I love to write. I would have written about 10 books by now. Um, I love so many things. I'm a big uh, basketball fan. I would have done like sports commentary. But um, I say that my life and and my experiences as, as a Black disabled woman is what drew me into the law. Um, basically, I have watched people advocate for me uh, my entire life growing up. I wouldn't be here without them. There was always something going on, whether my mom was fighting like the school bus company or some sort of doctor or physical therapist or whatever it was, whatever service um, I needed. Um, and so I benefited from the advocacy of others. And so I wanted to learn how to do that more formally on behalf of myself and on behalf of others like me. So it was really uh, a life decision, a strategic life decision that drew me into the law. So you began your career as a litigator at the National Center for Law and Economic Justice, at the Center for the uh, Constitutional Rights, and at the Racial Justice Program at the uh, ACLU. Can you tell us a little bit about the work you did as a litigator? Sure. Um, I'm still very much a litigator. I'm a, I'm a clinical law professor, and so clinics are many law offices inside of law schools where law students get to practice their skills by working on cases. So I very much have an active litigation docket right now today with my students. Um, but before I moved into academia, I began initially began my career at the National Office of the ACLU in their racial justice program um, as a fellow. I did two fellowships. So just in case, I know that fellowship has a different meaning in academia, but within legal practice, it's basically entry-level jobs, uh, particularly for lawyers who want to go into what we call impact litigation, which is what I do. Um, I do federal civil rights litigation, mostly class actions. So that means we challenge discriminatory policies and we don't usually represent individual clients. Um, so that's what I did at the National Office of the ACLU. That was my first job out of law school. I was in their racial justice program and I did everything you could think of that falls under the umbrella of racial justice. Um, did a lot of debtors' prisons work, school to pipeline work, um, got to do some fair housing and lending, got to write an amicus brief to the Supreme Court in Fisher II, the big affirmative action case. I got to, what else did I do? Got to do some Native American law there, so a pretty wide range of work. Then I went to the Center for Constitutional Rights, where I did another fellowship, and um, I was specifically on the government misconduct racial justice docket there. And I did a lot of discriminatory policing work. Um, uh, there's a case that you may have heard of. It's uh, Some people know about it. It's called Floyd versus the City of New York. It's the stop and frisk case uh, against the New York City Police Department. I worked on the remedial phase of that case. So basically trying to implement the changes that the judge in that case said needed to be made um, after, the, after the attorneys won the case. Um, I sued police departments in... St. Louis and Buffalo, New York. Um, so a lot of policing work. Um, what else did I do at CCR? I did 
um, some abusive immigration detention practices work. Um, so also a little bit of a, a wide range of work, but a largely policing work while I was at CCR. And then I moved to the National Center for Law and Economic Justice, where I was a staff attorney. Um, and I got to do a little bit more of a broader range of work in terms of finally moving into the realm of disability, um, which was which was part of the reason I decided to go there in particular. Um, I'm sure we'll get into this, but I found that even though I went to law school um, to be a civil rights lawyer, and I sort of assumed that disability would naturally be a part of civil rights, um, I found that the practice worlds um, were kind of siloed in that regard, that the quote unquote traditional civil rights spaces didn't really do disability work the way I imagined they might. And then that traditional disability rights spaces didn't really do, um, let's say, disability work with the racial justice lens that I was looking for and sort of the broader range of, of work that I was looking for, not, um, not just, um, you know, representing access related type issues. And so uh, at NCLEJ, that's where I first got to actually litigate cases under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and I got to do some work in Michigan, um, some work. Uh, we, we, that's where I actually developed the case that I brought with me to the clinic, challenging New York's crisis standards of care on behalf of people with disabilities. Sorry if I'm giving you way more information than you wanted, but I did a lot of a lot of uh, a lot more disability work there and also continue to do like discriminatory policing work and fines and fees related work there as well. So what led you to the academy? Why did you decide that you would move out of that kind of litigation into this clinical litigation that you do in law school? Yeah, um, kind of what I was talking about before, I felt a little bit like there was no country for me, so to speak, in practice. Um, there was no place that did the type of work that I wanted to do in the way that I wanted to do it. Um, I felt like in civil, in the quote unquote traditional civil rights spaces, I was always the person saying, and people with disabilities and people with disabilities. And then in more disability rights spaces, even though that wasn't the practice work that I did, I did other work like board work and things like that. But I always was trying to bring another lens to it in terms of broader social justice, civil rights, racial justice work. And I'm also um, many other things besides a lawyer, there are other things that I'm interested in. Like I said, I'm a writer. That's my first love. I sort of never stopped uh, writing and I'm a big nerd. <laughs> and I, I also noticed that, you know, I loved uh, a big part of my job at each of the places that I worked was like supervising interns. And I enjoyed that. Um, and so people started to talk to me about like, mm, you know, you should consider a career in the academy. It would sort of give you the space to do all of those things that you were interested in. And so that's how I became, uh, that's how I transitioned over. So uh, you direct the Civil Rights and Disability Justice Clinic at, at New York Law School. You want to tell us about what does that clinic do and what do you do there? Sure. Um, we do, we just came to the end of our second year. We do federal civil rights litigation. So basically what my professional background is, um, and the goal is to introduce students and to teach students that um, disability is an issue that cuts across all spheres of civil rights and social justice. Um, and we don't just represent people with disabilities. Uh, we represent um, a wide range of, of clients. Um, so we do both quote unquote traditional civil rights work and disability work. Um, and then in addition to the cases and sort of teaching students to interview clients and to brief and to research and write and all of the traditional lawyerly skills, uh, there's a seminar component where we read, um, you know, we read scholars and authors and other things like that just to expose students to issues of, of racism, ableism, so on and so forth. So you've just described the work there as being profoundly um intersectional work and you're following Kimberly Crenshaw in this focus on intersectionality and you you've written about um black disabled lives matter and the importance of of thinking about uh, civil rights law and disability rights law together can you say a little bit about why that there is a gap between civil rights law and disability rights law and what are some of the uh, strategies that you've personally been using to bridge that gap Sure. Um, I mean, I'm not sure that I can say that I know why there's a gap. Um, 
I think that there are many civil rights attorneys who recognize that disability is an issue. I think there are many disability rights attorneys who consider themselves to be civil rights attorneys and, um, and, and think that they fit within the broader scheme of civil rights. I know that the disability rights movement in particular modeled itself off of the civil rights movement for racial justice. Um, I think, though, that many people tend to think of disability as sort of a specialized niche issue. And so I think many civil rights attorneys may think that they don't have the experience or the authority to to speak on or to do work on behalf of people with disabilities if that's not what they were trained in or what they were exposed to. Um, you know, I went to law school again thinking that I would be exposed to all of these things, but never took a disability rights law class in law school because it wasn't offered while I was there. So I would imagine that that might be the experience for many people as well. Um, and because it is a different body of law, um, a different set of statutes like the Americans with Disabilities Act, for example, um, maybe people feel like they don't have the the specialization or expertise to specifically um, incorporate that body of work into their, into their advocacy. Um, and then I think, honestly, more broadly, um, ableism is an issue in our society. Um, I don't want to say that people don't necessarily care about people with disabilities, but again, I think that people think of disability as like this sort of specialized niche area, and they don't understand how the structure of ableism is something that impacts them, even if they aren't disabled. Um, how racism is a form of ableism, that it has to do with how we categorize and rank uh, people in society based on how we perceive their minds and bodies. Um, and so I think um, one of the ways that, that I try to quote unquote bridge the gap, um, if it exists, is that um, by doing that work, um, speaking about it, uh, writing about it, reading about it, because a lot of scholars taught me about it, uh, scholars and advocates, because I wasn't formally introduced to it in my own education. So a lot of scholars and advocates, uh, T.L. Lewis, whose definition of ableism is the one that I teach, um, you know, informs a lot of my work. Um, and then also when I was in practice, um, you know, if I was the person saying and people with disabilities and people with disabilities, uh, but I also tried to find ways to incorporate disability into our work. So for example, if we were doing school to prison pipeline work, um, that work disproportionately affects not only black students or students of color, but students of color with disabilities who are being ca categorized as quote unquote behavioral problems, which leads to their involvement in the criminal legal system. And so I would find disabled plaintiffs, for example, to figure, you know, to force it into our consideration. Um, those are just some of the ways that that I tried to to bridge the gap. So um, you've mentioned the Americans with Disabilities Act. So tell us about why that's an important um, uh, milestone in, in the disability rights movement, but also what are the limitations that have, have come to light after the many years that the ADA has been in effect? Sure. I mean, I think that the ADA is important because it gave us our rights. Um, it's, it's a sort of a baseline that establishes what uh, entities must do um, in order to not discriminate against people with disabilities. But I think as with every body of law, um, the ADA is a floor. It's not a it's not a ceiling um, that in order for laws to be effective, people have to know how to take advantage of their rights. People have to know that their rights exist. Um, and that's something that always comes with privilege, you know, which, you know, as we know in this society is often doled out based on race, class, and many other factors. You can have a body of law that says you're entitled to X, Y, or Z, but if you don't know it, or if you don't have access to an attorney to help you actually effectuate those rights, then it's not going to be all that helpful for you. So it's always going to be a problem of, of implementation um, and, and being able to take advantage of things. And then I think we also know that, I mean, laws perpetuate uh, a lot of hierarchy <laughs> and division. And so if you are someone that has access to the knowledge and power that comes with, you know, taking advantage of the law, 
it also creates categories. You have to fit into certain boxes in order to be eligible for the rights of the services. And so there's that. And so the ADA is an important step. We wouldn't be here without it. We still need it. But there's, you know, the law itself is often used as a tool of oppression. It doesn't implement itself. Um, and it's like I always say, a floor, not a ceiling. And it's something that, you know, the being able to take advantage of your rights is often something that has an impact that crosses uh, race, class, and every other marginalized group. So you've, one way of saying what you've just been saying is that there's a difference between disability rights and disability justice. Yes. And I think disability justice uh, is something entirely different in and of itself. Actually, just hosted a two-day conference um, in conjunction with my colleagues at Brooklyn Law School. They they run a disability and civil rights clinic there uh, where we, it was called Reclaiming Disability Justice um, because there's a critique that the language of disability justice has been co-opted or appropriated, if you will, by the academy and by the legal establishment. Um, and, you know, we fully recognize the irony of us being lawyers and academics who wanted to talk about that, but we also felt like, uh, let's get to the bottom of it. How do we, how do we use the resources that we have to get to the bottom of that? And disability justice is a movement that was created by disabled people of color, um, and disabled people of multi-marginalized identities, um, like Patty Byrne, Leroy Morrison's Invalid, um, in the 2000s, in the early 2000s, because they felt like they'd been left out of the disability rights movement in many ways. And that of all the things that I said before, like law perpetuates inequality in many ways. And so there's was this debate that we grappled with during the course of our conference. Can you do disability justice work in a legal space? Um, and there's some people who think that that's not the case, that that is inherently disability rights work. Um, and there are other people who say, yes, you can. It depends on the way that you do it. And it depends on the clients that you center and how you collaborate with them, so to speak. Um, and so that is, disability justice is about more than just, you know, rights and meaningful change and opportunity being afforded to disabled people of color and with multi-marginalized identities. I think it's really about addressing and hopefully dismantling the structural forces of ableism, um, not just using the law to do that, but using media, art, society, you know, all of the all of the tools at our disposal. So let's talk a little bit more about this efforts to use law to uh, improve justice. So you've recently written an article about the use of the ADA in environmental justice cases. So tell us a little bit about that legal strategy. Why why uh, certain uh, people are using the ADA for this to advance environmental justice, but also you also talk in that article about, you know, the limitations of using ADA, ADA for that. So tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Um, I actually really didn't write that article to so much explore um, the ADAs as a legal mechanism. Uh, there's, there's, there is a group of scholars um, and, and legal practitioners, frankly, who recognize that it is very difficult to challenge structural racism using the law. Um, and because you pretty much have to prove intentional discrimination, which it's, it's very difficult to prove uh, what's in someone's mind. And um, even though there are other mechanisms like disparate impact and things like that, that's also very hard to prove statistically and the courts um, and every other body has done a lot to make it really difficult to prove structural racism and, to, and to, or to challenge structural racism and to prove racial discrimination. And so a group of scholars and practitioners have really been thinking about other ways to challenge that. And so um, they said, well, you know, the ADA might be a good mechanism to do that because the ADA, you have this affirmative requirement to do something about discrimination. You have to make reasonable accommodations or modifications, right? And so they were like, wow, like here's a civil rights law that has an affirmative requirement to change your behavior in order to remedy discrimination. 
And so they said, well, this this is a better, this is the avenue we should be looking at to challenge structural racism. And what I tried to do was analyze that question because I had <laughs> I had a lot of thoughts about it. Um, and I felt like, again, it sort of leaves out the existence of people with multi-marginalized identities because there were also people who thought, well, oh, you know, we should use the ADA because it's a, it's sort of a more acceptable political identity. Like, you know, we can, we don't have to say it was because of their race. We can say we're helping this marginalized group. We can say we're helping the disabled or we're helping the quote unquote sick. And I was like, well, you know, disability isn't, it is a politicized identity in and of itself. And also people of color with disabilities exist. Um, and so I, you know, I, started looking into um it uh into environmental justice cases because I'm working we're working in the clinic on a we have a title 6 environmental justice um complaint before the currently before the EPA that's being investigated and so I'd been looking in into environmental justice work and um it occurred to me that environmental justice is a field where both issues of race and disability are prevalent uh, because not only are people of color disproportionately affected by environmental racism, but people with disabilities are also as well, and people of color with disabilities. And you sort of have these issues of um, like met the medicalization of things because environmental racism both affirmatively disables people, it makes them disabled, and it and it disproportionately affects people of color with disabilities. So I thought, what a, this is this is an interesting area to challenge or explore sort of that thesis or the hypothesis that the ADA could be more effective for challenging racial structural racism and, ra and racial discrimination. And that's what the article sort of gets at. So it acknowledges that, yes, there are certain apparent advantages to the use of the ADA to challenge environmental racism because for example, it requires the inclusion of people with disabilities um, in these challenges. And there's a critique that the environmental justice movement really only talks about people with disabilities as evidence of sort of like the negative consequences of environmental injustice. But the ADA, using the ADA would require them to include people with disabilities in the environmental justice strategy. Um, there is arguably, and I say arguably, less of a burden of proof in using the Americans with Disabilities Act to, ch to challenge environmental injustice. Um, but there are still factual questions. You have, to, you have to prove factually that you fit within the category of disability. So where there might be some benefits uh, that, that aren't present in the racial justice legal sphere, there are also some legal challenges as well. And then there's also just the narrative considerations. Um, you know, disability is a politicized identity. And rather than saying, oh, we have we finally have this mechanism to illustrate how um environmental racism affects people's health, you could also it it could also lead to the dismissal of these issues because you're like, oh, well, this is a group that's already vulnerable and they're people of color. So we're gonna cast them aside because it already fits into our stereotypes of who these people are and what they deserve. Um, so that's what the article tries to explore. Again, sorry, another long answer to your, to your question. No, no problems. Fascinating answer. Fascinating subject. Um, so as you say, di disability is a politicized identity. Um, but there's also a variety of disabilities, and there are a large group of inv so-called invisible disabilities. And so tell, tell us a little bit about the particular challenges, and, and I'm especially interested in the kind of legal challenges of defending disability rights for people who have invisible disabilities. Sure. I mean, I should say that I don't, my disability is not invisible. So I, I think that people with invisible disabilities are, those are the people who are best situated to speak to their experiences. But based on what I know, um, I mean, it is, it is exactly what you said because because their disabilities are are quote unquote non apparent. People often think that they don't exist and that they don't have to be. They're not entitled to accommodations. 
or the same the same rights or they have to work harder to prove prove in air quotes that they're that they're sufficiently disabled to to avail themselves of of rights and resources you've already told us that one of the things that appealed to you about going into the academy was that it would give you more space to do more of the things that you like to do and that you are good at doing so i mentioned at the top of the interview that you are a creative writer a poet can you tell us a little bit about the creative writing that you do? Sure. Um, I've written everything under the sun. I have I have poetry. I've published creative nonfiction essays. I've published a short story. Uh, I've published scholarship, like we just discussed. Uh, I've written op-eds. Uh, have I left an area of writing out? I'm pretty sure I probably do it. Uh, but I love to write. Um that has always been a way for me to express myself. And I just like, I like ideas. If that, if that does, hasn't come across, that's why another reason I knew I would fit in academia. I'm a big nerd, um, but I love to write and I have uh, for a really long time. Do you see a, an intersection between your creative writing and your work as a legal scholar and a, and a, and a litigator? Yes, absolutely. I think that people often try to, to present like types of writing and as as if they're in different categories. Um, like I remember interviewing with a federal judge for a clerkship and him him asking me about my writing. And I talked about, you know, my creative writing in addition to my legal writing. And he was like, oh, those are different. And I don't really think that they are. Um, they're different forms, right? Just like if I were writing a poem, it depends on the type of poem that that I'm writing. Like the structure might be different, the form might be different, but the the skill is the same. And I think that my background as a creative writer informs my legal strategy. It informs the way that I read and interpret things. Um, I think even like in the academy, there are a lot of people who are sort of intimidated by like writing and like a scholarly requirement and all of these things because they think of it as like this this um labor this 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 chore and i think of it as like a creative opportunity to figure out how to solve problems and things that i'm interested in i've been doing that my whole life so that to me there's no difference between the poem and the scholarly article it's just a matter of form well Brittany, that's a great answer to that question thank you so much for sharing that and thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today it's been really interesting conversation we're so excited that you'll be coming to the university uh, for your lecture in a week or so thank you for having me i've been speaking with Brittany wilson associate professor of law and director of the civil rights and disability justice clinic at uh, new york law school on may 16th 2023 Professor Wilson will give a talk, Down for the Cause, Grace, Space, and Belonging in Social Movements, as a guest of the Oregon Humanities Center and as part of the OHC's 2022-2023 Belonging Series. Thanks so much for watching. Mm -hmm.